Hey, Pastor Bobby here. I'm so glad you're joining us to hear what God is sharing with our community here at Chapel. And I pray, I am praying right now for you, that this message will bless you. It'll be an inspiration to you. It will challenge you to be who God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. Do. And so as we jump into the message, I pray that you open up your mind to God's Word, open up your heart to God's Spirit, and watch the two come together to bring a supernatural miracle in your life. So let's jump into what God is speaking to us right now. Well, good morning, Chapel. How's everybody doing this morning? I am sore. Like, I did a, our community group, we trained, all, they trained, I didn't make it to any of the trainings, but we went to the Warrior Dash yesterday in Tennessee, and it's like a 5K mud run that I did not train for. My back was already hurting and I ran through the mud. The first obstacle was a hill that went up about like that. And I thought to myself, if I just sprint up the hill, I can rest when I get to the top. Little to no sprinting up that hill would ruin my body for the rest of the day. And so spend some time with him hanging out. A really good time. A lot of good stuff going on. Uh, next Sunday is Mother's Day. Everybody say Mother's Day. Man, that means you have seven days. That means you can't show up Saturday night at Walgreens and get the last card that's there that's like, happy birthday, grandma. That does not work. Uh, you got seven days to take care of your moms and your, and your wives if you have kids and all that good stuff. But it's going to be special here. So we have the, the privilege and honor having Beth Grisham as our guest speaker. If you don't know Beth, she's spoken at some ladies' events uh, previously. But she's the director of Shoal Save a Life. And Shoal Save a Life is a crisis pregnancy center in town that is faith-based. And what they do is they give women hope that find themselves in very hopeless situations. And she has an incredible, incredible anointing to minister to women and minister to people in regards to hope. So she'll be here. And usually for Mother's Day, we kind of sh give gifts away to honor moms. Uh, last year we did truffles and some giveaways. This year we're going to reverse that. And so with Beth being here, she ministers to a lot of women who are looking to have an abortion because they just don't have the money or having an abortion because they don't know what to do. And they go there and they find hope and end up having the baby and they walk out with them, not just the pregnancy, but long term with them. And so what we wanna do is bring gifts in for these young moms and these older moms, these, these women are having babies. And if, so if you can bring in formula or newborn diapers or pacifiers, or uh, stuff like Desitin. Desitin is a big deal for new moms. And so those things will be a huge blessing that probably most of us in this church don't need, but they need in a huge way to be able, when these moms have babies, to give that to them and say, listen, we love you. We want to encourage you. We want to help you. And here's a gift to get you started on the right track. So next Sunday, bring some formula and pacifiers. If you don't know what a pacifier is, you never had a baby. And if you have a baby and you, they are on a pacifier, you need like 25 million just to make it through life. You lose one, you lose another one, you got to find one. So bring some of that in to help us out. Then the next week is our graduation Sunday, which is the day we take to honor all the graduates, graduating from sixth grade, moving up to middle school or high school, uh, high school graduates, college graduates, vocational school graduates. It's the day we just set back, we honor all those graduates. So we need your help that if you're graduating from anything, sixth grade, high school, college, vocational school, if you'd please, there's a form in your worship guide that has a, a text in number, please text that number so we can honor you correctly. And this is gonna be an incredible Sunday. We're gonna empower some of our young communicators in our church that are graduating from high school and college. And even RJ is going to preach. Um, so we're gonna break it down in, into five to seven minute messages for them. And so it's gonna be a really cool Sunday. And the week after that, we'll come back to you ask for it. So today, you asked for it. So we asked you to submit questions that we could answer uh, through the Bible in church, and we had over 50 different questions. And so I'm going to answer these this Sunday, and then Memorial Day weekend, I'm going to answer the rest of them. And they range in many different ways. Memorial Day, we're really going to focus on pain and suffering and evil and really deep theology. Today, we're going to focus on eternity, salvation, um, and some worship and some other practicality things. So you asked for it. So on the count of three, everybody say, you asked for it. That means if this message is not good, it's your fault because it's your questions. <laughs> so uh, a lot of good questions. The first one, and I'm going to read it to you, says, do dogs slash animals have souls and do they go to heaven? Do all dogs go to heaven? So that one is a no, because if you ever had some of the dogs I had, there's no way they're making it to heaven. Uh, and if they do, how is there 100% peace if all cats do too? So answer the, I'll answer this in segments. So the first one is, do dogs slash animals have souls? No. When God created everything in creation, everything he created, he spoke, and he spoke it, and he created those things to point to his glory. 
So when you go to the mountains in Gatlinburg, those mountains were designed to point to the glory of God. When you go to the beach, that beauty was designed to point to the glory of God. All the animals were designed to point to the glory of God. But when it came to man, he formed man in his own image. Man and woman are the only creatures that God formed in his image. So everything's created for his glory, but we are specifically created for his image. That means we have a soul like God has a soul. Animals don't have souls. Now, will animals be in heaven? I don't know about in heaven like paradise or Abraham's bosom like we talked about last week. But when it says the new heavens and new earth, it says the lamb will lay down with a lion. So I believe there will be animals in the new heavens and the new earth and that kind of thing. So if you have animals and you love them a lot, maybe they'll make it, maybe they don't. If they act wrong, maybe they'll not make it to heaven. Um, Number two, what is true worship and does it really matter if there's music, no music, hands raised or not, et cetera? So great question, lots of different beliefs on uh, church worship, music, no music, how to worship, et cetera. Um, So I'm gonna give you a couple quick definitions on what worship is. So worship is drawing attention to God. So when we worship, we're drawing our attention to God, to his promises, to his character, to his power, to his throne, to his eternal promises he's given us. So worship is I'm changing my attention from what is around me. I'm changing my attention or my focal point or my perspective from my problems or my pain or my issues. And I'm taking that attention and I'm focusing it on God or as David said, where my help comes from. Your help's not going to come from your problems. It's going to come from heaven. And so when you worship, you're drawing or focusing your attention on heaven. Number two, worship is expressing externally what we cannot express internally. So what that means is worship is an attempt to express outwardly what God has done for me internally. Baptism. Baptism doesn't save us. It represents an external expression of what God is doing inside of me. He's given me a new life in Christ. I express that through baptism in the same way. My heart is happy. My heart is grateful, my heart is joyful, my heart has been renewed and I express that through worship. And and the most common form of worship is music, but there's many different ways to express that. Worship is also the proper response to the presence of God. So everywhere in the Bible from beginning to end, every time someone has an encounter with God, God shows up or the presence of God shows up or Jesus shows up, anytime that happens, the response was worship. And so the proper response to an encounter to God or the presence of God is worship. If you don't feel like you're worshiping, it means you may not have had an encounter with God. Because when you had an encounter with the most high God, it puts you in a place of of awe and adoration and gratitude and thankfulness. And so to break it down, here's some Hebrew words for worship in the Old Testament. Barak, which is not Barack Obama. Barak, which means to kneel or bow or to give reverence to God as an act of adoration. So that's a, that's a reverent form of worship. Halal, which is to praise or to make a show or rave about, to glory or boast upon, meaning to brag about God. When I worship, I'm bragging about who my God is. Renan, which is to uh, emit a stridulous sound or to shout aloud with joy, meaning to shout with joy as loud as you can. Shawar, which means to sing or a singer. Uh, Talila, which means to sing a new song with a hymn or spontaneous praise. It's tahila, not tequila. So if you drink tequila, that's a whole different style of worship. Um, Yada, to use, hold out the hand or to throw like a stone or arrow to revere in worship. Basically means to lift up your hands in worship. Which people ask, why do you lift your hands in worship? It's a sign, one, of surrender, meaning God, I'm yours. It also a sign of, of proclamation, like I'm lifting my hands, lifting up where I'm trying to get to. And like when our kids were young, like there was times where I worked a whole lot of hours and RJ was a baby. I remember when I'd walk in the door into the house, he'd lift his arms for me to pick him up. And it's almost like my dad is home, my dad is in my presence, I just wanna be with you. And that's, when we lift our arms, that's another form of, I just wanna be with God, I just wanna be with you, I'm reaching up towards you. Uh, Zamar is to play stringed in- instruments or a musical instrument to make music accompanied by the voice. Alats is to jump for joy or to be joyful or to triumph. Uh, Ana, which is to pay attention to or to respond to or to testify or announce. Meaning, I'm testi- when I worship, I'm letting everybody else know what God has done for me. I- I'm letting everyone around me know that God has been good to me. God has saved me. God has healed me. God has taken care of me. God has protected me. And kafar, which means to inscribe or to recount or celebrate. Meaning, I'm going to remember what God has done for me and I'm going to recount. I'm going to worship 
to recount the blessings God has given me. So those are the Old Testament words. The New Testament, some of them are uh, proscunio, which means to kiss the hand toward or to prostrate oneself. Meaning I'm gonna lift my hands towards him same way as in the Old Testament or lay down in reverence. Uh, Epanios, which means to praise or accommodation or to put God on top. So if you've ever been in, mostly in black churches, they put a praise on it. That means, put a praise on it means put that on top of it. And so the way I explain that is throughout the week, there's, there's a throne on your heart that is seeking to be occupied by someone or something. And so this throne is always looking for what, for what fits that throne. And so during the week, it could be your finances start trying to sit upon that throne. It could be your kids, your life is revolving around them. They're getting the most attention and adoration and they try to get on that throne. It could be your job or career, it could be your problems. They're all seeking to get on this throne. And when you come into worship, worship is kind of removing all those other things off the throne and putting God back on the throne of your heart. It's reevaluating and reestablishing those priorities in your heart. And Latria, which is worship in serving through our bodies and gifts. And so that means uh, ushers and greeters or our baptism team who put forth a lot of effort to get the baptism ready, get the people ready to serve them, to love on them, to pray for them. That's, that's their form of worship. They're serving God or worshiping God through serving, which is another form of worship. And so you say, are instruments uh, supposed to be used or not supposed to be used? I believe music is not worship. I believe music is an expression of worship. When Jesus said worship in spirit and truth, he's meaning worship should come out, come out of your heart and how you express it is up to you. Music is just our primary mode of expression because we all have that in common. And if the heart's not right, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if your heart is wrong and you're worshiping with instruments, it's not worship. If your heart is wrong and you're worshiping a cappella, it's not worship. Worship is an expression of the heart. I will say in the Old Testament, they had instruments that they used to worship God in battle. They, they used it for the temple. And even in the New Testament, we see it in Revelation and in heaven. And so there's, there's instruments in the Old Testament and in heaven. And so I believe it's a great expression for us now. But that's a preference. If somebody worships, a church of Christ worships with no instruments, that's still worship. And if you as a believer, say you're from our church and you go to a church of Christ church and you can't worship because they don't have instruments, you're not a true worshiper. You like an environment and you like music, but you don't actually worship God. In the same way, if you come from a Church of Christ background and you can't worship when there are instruments, then it's the same scenario. And so worship is those three things, but worship is also this. Worship is what God inhabits. It says God inhabits the praises of his people. And I think it's in 1 Corinthians either five or six, and then I think in 1 Kings chapter eight, Solomon has just built God's temple here on earth. And they do a, a couple things. One, they read through the entire law. So Solomon brings all the, all the Jews, all the Hebrews together. He reads through the book of the law, basically reading the Bible. Then they consecrate or, or make sure all the utensils in the temple are holy and set apart. Then they begin worshiping and praising with instruments and it's worshiping God. It says, then the glory of God filled the temple and it was so thick that the ministers could not minister anymore. And so worship is a response to God's presence, but it is also a precursor to God's presence. Meaning when I worship, I'm not bringing God's presence in. God's presence is everywhere. But when I worship, I'm drawing my attention to his presence, which then manifests itself in my presence. Does that make sense? And so many times if you don't feel like you're worshiping or you don't feel like God is moving in your life, maybe it's because you're not praising him. If God inhabits your praises, the way you can get God to move more in your life is to begin to praise him where you are at. Next question is, why is it the Shema still common practice today or studied more? So the Shema is basically like something, a memory verse that all Israelite children would memorize. And it's Deuteronomy chapter six and I'll read it for you. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So every Hebrew had that memorized. And what was amazing about it, in that time, every other religion had all these other gods. They had a God for the stars, a God for the sun, a God for water, a God for flowers, a God of trees, all these gods. And here the Hebrews worship one God. And they said, this God takes care of all those other things combined. And so when they say the Lord is one, it was a huge, huge saying, and the reason we don't practice it anymore is because we know God is one, but we also replace this with the Lord's prayer and the great commandment. The Lord's prayer declares that God is one. 
It declares who God is. And the great commandment says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and all your strength. The same thing as this verse. And so that's why we don't practice it anymore. In our pre-service meeting, Anthony Martin asked the question. He said, I didn't submit this, but I wanted to ask it. He said, how can I better stay awake while you preach? So my answer was, why do you think we give away free coffee? Like that's the whole purpose of the coffee is to keep you awake while we preach. And don't ever ask that question again. Uh, Next one, sin. Is sin like murder, rape, worse than cheating on your spouse or watching pornography? So are some sins greater than other sins? And so real quick, I'll answer that is all sin is the same to God, but it's different in its impact to the relationships around us. So all sin, whether it's pornography or infidelity, affects your relationship with God the exact same way. But how it affects your horizontal relationships will all be different. And so sin, we have to quit defining sin based on our human abilities and start defining sin how God does it. So we try to define sin based on our laws. So we have misdemeanors, felonies, all these other capital offenses, all these things that we feel like, well, this fits there, that fits there, that fits there. Well, as long as I get a misdemeanor, maybe I can just pay my fine and get away with it. Well, with God, they're all lumped into the same bucket because all sin creates separation between God and you. And there's nothing God wants more than to remove that separation between us. And so no matter what the sin is, it causes that separation and sin is missing the mark. It means I've missed the mark of God's standard. I've missed the mark of God's righteousness. I missed the mark of God's will. And so all sin is missing the mark, but all sin is also rebellion. Adam and Eve had a very, I feel like, very minor sin in the garden. They basically disobeyed God and ate something he told them not to eat. I feel like that's minor in the whole scheme of what could have been done. But what it shows is sin is rebellion and all rebellion is the same. If a king has a kingdom and one person rebels just a little bit and one rebels a lot, it still does the same thing to the kingdom. And so we have to move our definition of sin to it breaks God's heart and it destroys his kingdom. Then look at sin as it may affect our relationships differently, but here's why. I believe that if we had less pornography, we'd have less infidelity. I believe if we had less violence that we celebrated in our, in our culture, we'd have less murders. You look at just Chicago alone that has not just the highest murder rate in our country, almost one of the highest in the world. And it is a culture that's infiltrated with, with hip hop that celebrates violence day in and day out. And so what it tells us is when the small little yeast infiltrates your mind or your heart, it will produce something in the long term. And so if you could stop pornography early, it will prevent infidelity, rape, and everything else that you're looking for. Next question is, is Christ a title and what did it mean? So we say Jesus Christ, contrary to popular belief, Christ is not his last name. It is Jesus, comma, Christ. And what Christ means, it means chosen one or anointed one. And why that's such a big deal is for thousands of years, the Hebrews had heard prophecies about the chosen one. They'd heard prophecies about who this Messiah, this King, this anointed one would be. And then in Luke chapter four, Jesus stands up, opens up the book of Isaiah, and he says, I am the scripture. I have come, I'm anointed to preach the gospel, to set the captives free, to heal the brokenhearted. And it goes through all these things. What he was saying is, I am the chosen King. And so we say Jesus Christ, one, you're differentiating that Jesus from all the other Jesuses you know in the world. Like my dad, I grew up on construction sites. There's a lot of Jesuses. And I promise you, those Jesuses, their blood will not save you. Only Jesus, the chosen one, will save you. And so when I say Jesus Christ, I'm letting the devil, I'm letting people around me know it's not just any name. It is the chosen name. And that's why it is important. Um, (laughs) Will there be cheese in heaven? Well, if you're lactose intolerant, that would then become hell. So funny answer to that is in Greek, it says heaven, there's a sea of glass. So I think the Greek word for glass, since it's Cinco de Mayo, would be sea of queso. (laughs) What happens to people who never hear the gospel? Do they still go to hell? So great question, question about God's grace, God's mercy. So I'm gonna gonna read a couple of scriptures to you. One, Romans chapter three, verse 10 through 12 says, none is righteous. Touch your neighbor, say none. 
None is righteous, no, not one. So Paul's trying to like make sure we know, none is righteous, no, not even one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. That is the baseline. It's not like, you know, some are good, some are okay, some are bad. We're all bad. We're, we're born into sin. We're born evil. We're born not seeking God. That is the baseline. And so the solution is, God says in John chapter 3, 16 through 18, says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So God knows there's none righteous. So the solution is to send somebody who is righteous. And then it says, but here's the key. Um, it says, uh, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So might is key there. Might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the son of the only God. Meaning Jesus did not come to say, listen, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're pretty cool up there, but you, you're definitely not going. He didn't come to condemn anybody. Everybody was already condemned. What good does it do if somebody sick comes to you and you tell them how sick they are? It does no good. Jesus came to reach a world that had already been condemned by their own decisions. He came to bring a solution, not the problem. And so the problem with that is it says that, that they might be saved. Whoever believes might be saved. The might, he puts that on us because Romans chapter 10 says this, how then will they call on him whom they have not even believed? And how are they to believe in him who have not ever heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So everyone is condemned already. The only way they can be saved is through Jesus. And the only way they can be saved through Jesus is to believe the gospel that is preached to them. So the key is we look for a lot of excuses and try to put off on God what is actually our responsibility. If anyone goes to hell, it's not God's fault, it's our fault. Like, get this, if your coworkers go to hell, it's not God's fault, it's your fault. God has placed you in a place and sent you to preach the gospel to people who are perishing around you. He's done his work. Now he's shifted that to us and said, now you go and tell everybody. And so once we do that, that's why as a church, we have Chapel Haiti, that's why we do the Dream Center, that's why we send money to Guatemala and to Africa and to Russia and Ukraine and in Central America. We send resources because we're sending the word so that people that are condemned already will not perish without hearing the good news. That cannot just be a church thing, that has to be a heart thing for every single believer. Every believer has to say, I am called to evangelize. I am called to let people know about the grace of God. I'm, I, I am called to have this heart for people in the same way. Next question, are deathbed conversions legit? Well, the thief on the cross, I think is e easily the most easiest answer to this question. Jesus on the cross, he's innocent. He has two thieves on both sides. One thief starts mocking Jesus. Like, and to me, the, the, the audacity of somebody who's dying for a crime to make fun of somebody else for dying in the same way. So he's mocking him. The, the third thief or the third guy says, hey, why are you mocking him? We're guilty. He's innocent. Let him go. He is who he said he is. And Jesus looks at him and says, you will surely be with me in paradise this day. That is a, a deathbed conversion if I've ever, ever seen one. So the, the other side of that is you can't live your life however you want to saying, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to have fun. And right before I die, I'm going to ask God for forgiveness because conversion is not just saying, I, I want to make it to heaven. Conversion is saying, I trust that you're truly the king and I surrender my life to you, whether I have five minutes left or 50 years left. It's surrender, which then that you die to your old self and be converted or born again in Jesus. I, some deathbed conversions are legit. Some, I believe, are just a, a cheap ticket to try to escape the penalty of hell and try to make it to heaven. And also, Adrian Rogers, if you know who Adrian Rogers was, one of the great preachers of all time. Adrian Rogers said there's three surprises that you'll see when you get to heaven. He said, one, you're going to be surprised by the people who are there that you never thought would be there. 
So the second question or the second surprise will be, you're going to be surprised at the people you don't see that you thought would be there. He said the third surprise, you're going to be surprised that you're actually there. (laughs) Um, How do I get my children to come to church with me without making them hate church? They are 15, 14, and 10. They are believers. They just don't want to come to church. Um, So I have a whole lot of commentary on this, actually. But uh, first is there is nowhere in the Bible and nowhere in the world where somebody has a conversion with Jesus and they end up hating the church. Nowhere. This whole mentality of, well, I love Jesus, I have a relationship with Jesus, but I I don't really like church. It'd be like you saying, well, I like you, Bobby, but I I don't like your wife. I'll go out to eat with you, but just don't bring your wife along with you. It would cause tension between you and me. And so we say, well, I love Jesus, but I don't like his bride. It, 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 it puts you in tension with Jesus himself. And plus, you're saved not just to God, you're saved into God's family, into community. And so there is a place in church. Secondly, your kids are 15, 14, and 10, it says on here. There, you don't reach a certain wisdom point to make decisions that impact your life for a long term until you reach a certain age. That's why the Bible tells us to to raise your kids in the way they should go. Train them up in the way they should go. It doesn't say just let them do what they want and hope they make it. You have to train kids in the things of God. You have to train, like anything else, you have to raise them a certain way. And, And two, your kids, what happens is we're so scared of our kids, what they think about us, that we lose sight of what God thinks about things. What that means is, If we start letting our kids, I'm scared to make a decision that impacts my kids because I'm afraid what they might think. We start lifting up what they think over what God thinks. And contrary to popular belief, our kids hate me and Toya about three weeks out of the month. They are teenagers, they hate our decisions, but we make decisions that are best for them long term. Kids make decisions that are based on best for them for the short term. Get this. God places you in positions and helps you make decisions for the best long-term result. We tend to make decisions for ourselves based on the best short-term result. The best is the long-term result. Your kids are under your authority. And I think we're in such an anti-authority culture that that we are afraid that if we actually walk in our authority, we're bossy or judgmental or legalistic. God has given you authority of your house. And if you don't take authority of your house, somebody else will. And you have to take authority for your kids until they have their own authority over their their lives. And the other side is Psalms 92, we preached on this last year. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. Everybody say planted. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They're planted in the church. They flourish in the courts of God and they still bear fruit in old age. People are always saying, well, 18 year olds, they, they get out of high school, they leave the church. You know why? This verse tells us that children, that people have a place where they flourish in God, and that is God's house. When they plant roots in God's house, it says they will produce fruit even in old age. The reason kids, there's a couple reasons, but the main reasons they leave the church when they're 18 is one, their roots were never planted in the house of God. They were planted in their hobbies, sports, music, their friends. Their roots were in everything else except for the house of God. They show up to the house of God on Sundays hoping to get a pass for everything else, but their roots are in something else. Wherever your roots are, that's the fruit you will produce every single time. And so we have to make sure our roots are planted in the right spot. Next question is, uh, (laughs) why are you so tall? My question is, why are you so short? You know, I've been asked a million times in Walmart, can you reach that up on the top shelf? I'm like, I don't ask you because you're short if you reach that on the bottom shelf. It is better. I used to get asked, why are your legs so skinny? Old people in church be like, are you wearing shorts? Are those your legs or are you riding a chicken? I didn't get the joke for like six years. Uh, what is the land of Nod and did Adam have children with Lilith and why is this not talked about? So this is dealing with Cain and Abel. After Cain kills Abel, God sends him out of where they were living into the land of Nod. So this is one of those things that in translation, the land of Nod, Nod actually means wandering. So he sent Cain into the land of wandering. 
meaning he'd no longer have a family base, no longer have the roots in where they were at. He'd be wandering for the rest of his life. That was his punishment, to wander. So land of Nod is nothing more than wandering. It's not like the land of Tuscumbia or Sheffield. It's the land of just wandering. And then the Lilla thing, the reason that's not talked about is that didn't come around until like the 700 to 1000 AD. And what it was in the Middle Ages, the, the Catholic Church was just tremendously corrupt. I mean, corrupt. And they started creating different doctrines and theologies to support their corruption. And so some of that was they were high in sexual promiscuity and sin inside the church. And Lilith became an excuse for that. So they created this Lilith figure. They said when Adam was first created, it was Adam and Lilith, Lilith were created first, both out of the clay of the ground. But Lilith didn't want to be subservient to Adam. And so she rebelled. She ended up messing around with, with the serpent and the slave. And she was cursed to have a thousand kids a day. Like one, a thousand kids a day. A thousand. Like one a day is enough. I've never done it, but it looks like it's enough. A thousand. That was her punishment. So then she was cast out of the garden. Then God gave him a second wife, which was Eve. That's contrary to everything in scripture. And so what they did was they created this to give them a self excuse. They would blame it on Lilith. That's why we're sexually promiscuous. So the reason we don't talk about it, it has nothing to do with the Bible. It was made up in 700 AD to 1000 AD. Uh, next one. How do you know God has called you to be a prophet? It's a good question. I would say the woman at the well, when she encountered Jesus, Jesus told her, he said, hey, you've been married this many times and the person you're with now is not even your husband. Her answer was, sir, you per I perceive you to be a prophet. Now notice Jesus didn't show up and say, I'm a prophet. I'm about to tell you something. See, your gift, when in use, will be perceived by others. This title junk that people in church world have is not of God. Like when you say, well, I'm a prophet, well, I'm a pastor, I'm a, I'm a preacher, I'm an evangelist, I'm, I'm an apostle. God does not care about, he cares about things being fulfilled. He doesn't care about titles. And what that means is if you feel like you're a prophet, if you begin prophesying, people will recognize the gift within you. And then spiritual authority, somebody has authority over you, somebody you're accountable to will recognize the gift in you and confirm it. But I've seen people, they'll give me business cards, and they'll say, prophet so-and-so. You know what I do with those? Crumble it up, throw it away. If you have to tell me you're a prophet, what you're doing is you're trying to create equity to get me to listen to what you have to say. The gift should be equity enough. And Proverbs says, your gift shall make room for you. Not your title, not, not your hopes, not your business card, not your YouTube channel, not your podcast. Your gift shall make room. So how will you know you're called to be a prophet? One, you'll prophesy. And you'll prophesy correctly. And then somebody that you're accountable to will recognize the gift within you and confirm it in a godly way. How can you know for sure you are saved? Well, you, just, you ask your wife. That's what I do. <laughs> Uh, one, Billy Graham taught this years ago. He said there's four pillars of assurance of salvation. One is God never lies. So God says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. So God, you have to trust God's word and trust his promises. That's number one. Two is Jesus paid it all. Meaning Jesus paid for all of your sin, not just some of it. Jesus paid for your entire life, not just some of it. The problem is a lot of us walk around with unconfessed sin. And if it's unconfessed and unrepented for, it's not paid for. And what that means is many times we don't feel confident in our relationship with God because we're holding something back from him. And when you confess it, it clears that space to have that assurance of salvation that you're looking for. Number three is there should be evidence of new life. That if you're saved, it's not just a decision, there's a transformation that happens. That's why we do these I was, but God, I am statements. That if your life is the same as, as it is now, as it was before you got saved, then there may be a question if you had that but God moment in your life. There should be a drastic contrast between who you are before you met Jesus and who you are now. If not, you need to check yourself and see if you've had that confession, had that conversion experience with Jesus. And number four is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, many, many gifts of the Spirit. One of the primary, I believe the most important gift of the Spirit is this. It says he's a guarantee of our salvation. 
He's a seal of redemption upon us. Meaning, being filled with the Holy Spirit is not about tongues or spiritual gifts or prophecy or, or different worship styles. The greatest gift of the Spirit is God pouring His Spirit in you saying, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. It, it's this, this confirmation that God is so pleased with me, He'll pour His Spirit into me. Dr. Kendall, uh, one of my mentors, uh, he was Nazarene. And he was going back and forth to college. He got filled with the Holy Spirit in his car. And he said, at that moment, he said, I'd always questioned my salvation. I was never sure if I was right with God. And when that happened, he's like, I knew from that point forward, I was saved and I was forever saved. So you can know, you don't have to go through this wishy-washy junk of life wondering, am I in, am I out, am I saved, am I unsaved? You can know, just like my kids know they're my kids, you can know through the confirmation of God's Spirit that you are saved. Um, relationships, how can you soften your heart towards people to genuinely love them? Well, I think it's obviously vitally important that one of the great commandments is love God and love people. So, but there's way too many believers that love God and hate people. And if you love God through other people, if you can't love people, that's a, that's a heart problem. And like you see the Westboro Baptist people, right intentions, wrong actions. The world is already condemned. They're, they're saying God hates this, God hates that. God doesn't hate anybody. God is trying to restore and rescue everybody. And so if you have a problem loving people, the first step is this. Conversations lead to compassion. Touch your neighbor and say conversations. Conversation, when you have a conversation with somebody you disagree with or a conversation with somebody you have a difference with, you'll learn and understand their story, their motivations, and their heart which leads to compassion. The reason there's no compassion in our world is now everybody gets on social media, they throw out their opinions, they throw out their ideas, they throw out their thoughts, they throw them out, and there's never a conversation to hear the heart behind the thought. Many times people can think wrong things and do wrong things, but their heart is actually right. When you understand their heart, you can understand them and you can love them. The other thing is this scripture, it says Romans 5, 6 through 8, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for the righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when I have difficulty loving people, I go back to this verse. And I think, God loved me when he should not have loved me. God had mercy on me. God served me. God gave to me when I didn't deserve it. So I should love other people when they're in the same place I used to be. So what happens with, as, we, as you get saved, the more time you spend being saved, the more you forget who you were before you met Jesus. And when you forget who you were before you met Jesus, you'll start judging other people based on who you are now instead of who you used to be. And if they're where you used to be, it's not fair to judge them what took you 20 years to get to. And so when you have a conversation, you remember who you were and you have a conversation to figure out who they are, then you can love them where they're at to get them to where God wants them to be. Um, I'll skip that one. How does God reveal his truth of Jesus to people in countries where the gospel is not heard, in countries like Iran or Iraq where Christianity, Christianity is suppressed? One, the church thrives in areas where the church is suppressed, much more so than in America. Where in America, where we have churches every corner, we have Christian television, we have Bibles everywhere, the church is in decline. But in places like Iran, Iraq, and Somalia, the church is increasing tenfold. As a matter of fact, in China, the church had gotten a little bit of a legal status, and once it got legal status, it started to decline. Now they just outlawed Christianity again in China. And when they did, the church started to explode again. There's something that happens when you're, when you're discomforted, the power of God moves into authenticity. When you, when you worship because you want to rather than you feel like you're supposed to, there's a power that settles in that Christianity and it spreads like wildfire. The other side is, depending on what your belief system is, that there's, there's twofold. God can move through us as we share the gospel but where we can't get to, God actually beats us to the punch. And what that means is uh, many missions organizations have done research on Muslim converts. And there was one that was out of 600 Muslim converts, 600, 25% were converted through a dream. Listen, 
In places where the gospel was hard to get to, God couldn't send a preacher in, God couldn't, couldn't do something miraculous or, or something through a person. He was showing up to them in dreams. So much so one, a guy was in his sleep. He said a man in a white, flowing with white, showed up in his dream. And he told him a couple things. He said, stand up and follow me. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, for I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Dude wakes up, there's a refugee camp close by that had a couple of pastors. He'd never heard the gospel, never seen a Bible. He shows up 6 a.m. after being woke up from this dream, finds the first pastor, he says, he says, I met this man in the dream. He said, here's what he looks like, here's what he said. And the pastor said, have you ever heard the Bible or seen the Bible or read a Bible before? He said, no. He opened up to Revelation where Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He said, Jesus showed up to you in a dream and preached the gospel to you. Do you see how powerful that is? That God is a, a word and spirit God. If the word can't get there, he'll use a spirit to preach his word, but the word is always there. And so God has, I have a great friend. Uh, he's part of the Every Nation uh, church movement. His name is Mahmoud. And so he was in Iran and he was a pastor. He got arrested. They were about to per, uh, persecute him and kill him. And the only way they could do it legally was to release him from the court to the churches, to the Muslim churches, to the, to the enoms or imams or whatever it is to kill him. There was something happened. They released him a couple hours too early. He escaped accidentally. Like he escaped. He got out of Iran into a refugee camp. Uh, every nation, churches, is a worldwide church movement. They got him into Canada. They wanted to get him into America. They could not get his passport or his visa because his name was, and I may mess it up, but it was like Mahmoud Hussein. And it was like two years after or a few months after September 11th, 2001. So the government's like, nobody named Hussein or Mahmoud or Muhammad gets in. So they got him to Canada and then Australia and then got him in. Here's what he does now. He goes back, one day I was with him, he had his computer up, he was Skyping pastors in Iran, Jordan and Syria. And he called it discipleship. He was discipling pastors, going back to these refugee camps in, in Jordan and Turkey, outside of Syria and Iran. People are fleeing Iran and Syria into these refugee camps. He's preaching the gospel. They're getting saved. He's training them. They're going from the refugee camp back into persecution and preaching the gospel. Like God is moving in tremendous ways where we cannot move. Um, the Church of Latter-day Saints has a book of Moses claiming that Satan wanted Moses' body. Where do they claim to have gotten this book? Well, the Mormons, here's kind of their, their philosophy, theology. Joseph Smith, who lived around 1830 A.D., had a revelation from God where God said, hey, there's some gold tablets buried in your backyard. It's already awkward. Gold tablets buried in the backyard. It's extra revelation from the Bible. So he goes, he reads it or whatever happens. Then he says, okay, this is the book of Genesis, but I'm gonna add a few more chapters and call it the book of Moses. Then he added more books and he called it the book of Mormon. So it's revelation happened 1800 years after Jesus was here that it was outside of the Bible. So Mormons have great morals, they have great ethics, they do some great things, but their religion is based on something outside of scripture. So you have Mormon friends, do not take this the wrong way, but this is every cult, and a cult is not a satanic organization, it's anything that takes a little bit of God's truth, adds to it, elevates a man or a prophet and then implements a system of works. Every cult has the exact same four pillars. Extra revelation, man lifted up, system of works. All of them have that. Mormonism elevates Joseph Smith, extra revelation, implements works. That's why Mormons have to go on their missions. They're, it's a works-based salvation. Islam, Muhammad had a revelation in a cave that was extra biblical. He elevated himself, then he implemented a system of works. All of them, I can spot a cult a mile away. Whenever you recognize the leader of the religion or the church more than the Jesus of the church, it's already wrong. Anytime you push people through works rather than through grace, grace is the engine or the fuel for us to do works. Works is not the fuel or engine for grace. And when you get it switched up, it becomes a cult. I've heard people say there's lost books of the Bible. If there are, how do people know they're really lost books? So that's the Apocrypha, which basically is this. The Catholics, if you go by a Catholic Bible, it has 14 extra books in the Old Testament. The reason for that, 
A lot of times in the New Testament, you read, they'll quote Old Testament scriptures. There's some outside resources that are quoting the Septuagint. The Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Old Testament. So in Jesus' time, there was two Old Testaments. There was a Hebrew Old Testament. There was a Greek Old Testament. The Hebrew Old Testament had 14 less books than the Greek version. So when the, church, the Catholic Church began, they wanted to add the Greek stuff to it. In the Reformation, when we reformed the Catholic Church to get the Protestant movement, they wanted to keep it pure in only the Hebrew-inspired books. So that's where those extra books come from. And then you had the canon. Somebody asked about how do we know the, where the Bible came from and translated, etc. In about 387 AD, there was a council where they were trying to get a final Bible. They had all these different letters and books floating around from church to church to church. And they wanted to approve books that they would hold fast and believe and study together. So hundreds of these priests and pastors came together and there was a couple of rules they had. One, it had to be written by an apostle or an eyewitness account of Jesus. So this is for the New Testament. So it had to be somebody who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, or they included Paul who had an encounter with Jesus on the Damascus road. Secondly, it had to already be used by churches. So a lot of these letters, Paul's letters, the gospels were already being copied and used in churches already. Then thirdly, it had to be established doctrine. It couldn't be something that was different than the doctrine they already had. They filtered through those. I believe it was God's will to have all those put in this book to maintain a thread of faith throughout the rest of time. So that's where that came from. Then last two questions. Salvation, how can your name be blotted out of the book of life if it was already written in it? It's a good question. Well, if you're an Alabama fan, if you're losing, it can be blotted out very quickly. Psalm 69, 28, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. So this is where people get this bad doctrine from. So David was being surrounded by his enemies. His prayer was literally, God, kill them. In the book of life, it's translated differently. The Old Testament, the book of life, book of the living meant life. It meant physical life, like living, breathing, heartbeat, et cetera. So he's like, God, wipe them out. Just blot them out of, of the life right now. Blot them out. I can't handle this anymore. And in Revelation, here's what it says. The beast that you saw was and is, uh, is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and it is to come. Two different terms. Book of life, Old Testament is physical life. Book of life in the New Testament is eternal life. It says your name was written before the foundations of the earth. God is not up in heaven writing your name and saying, well, there's Toya Gorley. Mm, that was a bad week. Let's scrub that up. Ray Sartain, I saw you at that Tough Mudder. There's some... I saw you whisper some words under your breath. Well, wipe his name out. God's not sitting up there. Many people think God's eraser is bigger than his pencil. Like God is not wiping out anybody's name. And here's why. Your name is written in the book of life through the blood of Jesus. It's not in pencil. It's not in pen. It's not on a typewriter. It's written in his very blood and you can't wash his blood out. So you don't have to worry about am I in, am I out. If your name is written in it, you are in the book of Life. And last question, why does God require a blood sacrifice? Great question. Why could, why could God not do it a different way? A couple of reasons. Leviticus 17 says it this way. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. So everybody say life. And I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So blood represents two things. One, blood is where your life is. Once your blood stops pumping, you die. It carries oxygen to your muscles. It carries oxygen to your brain. It is, the, it is the avenue for life to flow in you. But blood is also representative of death. Meaning if your blood stops flowing, if you see blood, horror movies, death movies, lots of blood representing death. Blood is one of the unique qualities or things or resources that represents both life and death. So God wanted blood to demonstrate the seriousness of sin. That blood represents sin has a punishment of death to it. But blood also grants us life. And so the blood of Jesus is the penalty that should have been ours, our death, but it also grants us new life. Blood is this amazing, amazing illustration of both. And so as we take communion with this, it's our time to focus on, listen, this, this blood should have been my blood. 
Like Jesus' blood should have been my blood running down the cross. I deserve death. But because of Jesus' blood, now I have everything that was flowing through him, all his joy, all his hope, all his love, all his holiness, all his righteousness, all his purity. Now it flows through me. And so when we take communion or the Lord's Supper, it represents both my death and my life. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians I'll read it to you as we get ready. He says to examine yourself. He says, this is my body, which is for you. Do it this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Therefore, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who drinks, eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have even died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. What that means is blood is precious. When your blood stops flowing, your life is gone. The blood of Jesus is precious. And when we stop valuing the blood of Jesus, we start taking it for granted that our salvation was not free. It was free for us, but it cost Jesus everything. It cost him his life. It cost him his blood. Whenever we get to a place where we, we become, it becomes too common to us. We take it in an unworthy manner. And so for just a quick moment, I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes after you receive your elements. I want you just to examine yourself and, and ask yourself, am I taking the blood of Jesus for granted? Am I using it for an, an excuse to sin? Am I using it for an excuse to live my life how I want to and get cheap grace? Am I living my life in a way that's worthy of his blood? Am I living my life in a way that glorifies him and honors him for his sacrifice? Am I living my life out of his grace instead of trying to earn his grace? Father, we thank you. And we thank you for the broken body of your son, Jesus, that this bread represents his body being battered and beaten, his body laying upon that cross and then laying within a grave, but now being resurrected, now sitting at your right hand. Father, we thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus, that represents the death and also the life. Right now, Father, I pray as we examine ourselves, you open up our minds, our eyes, our hearts to any areas of our lives that are unworthy. And I pray, as Father, as we do, we confess those areas and we let you wash out every area of our, of our lives and our hearts with the perfect, unblemished blood of your son, Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you for it. Let us mark our minds with his grace and his glory and let us live a life worthy of representing the great price you paid for our lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the bread. Father, we thank you for this bread. We ask that you bless it. Help us to realize the healing we have through the stripes that he has taken and let us live a life worthy of his life, in Jesus' name, let's eat together. In the same way, let's take the cup. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, which is perfect where we're imperfect, which is holy where we're unholy. And Father, we plead the blood over our lives, over our families, over our minds, and over our hearts. And Father, we thank you that there is life forevermore in him, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink together.